everyone. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Get Ready. And uh, today I have a very amazing guest. Uh, I first found out about this very accomplished woman uh, probably over a year ago when uh, my friend Rachel said, hey, do you want to be involved in this thing called Quest 79? And it sounded like an amazing, uh, an amazing program, an amazing event. And I was happy to participate. So let me tell you a bit about the founder, Dr. Karen Dark. Karen started out uh, as a geologist and then um, through some things that happened, <laughs> which I may allow you to elaborate a little bit more on that, <laughs> um, found herself looking for uh, her inner gold, mining the, uh, the treasures inside and finding a lot and becoming a, uh, a Paralympic gold medalist, a, uh, an extreme athlete, and also an amazing coach and has uh, certifications and awards um, far more lengthy than I can list here, <laughs> given the amount of time we have. <laughs> so I'll post that all on the website, but uh, it is an honor and a privilege, and I'm so excited to have you, Karen. Thank you for oh. being here. Thank you, Brad. No, it's really good. It's really good to be here. And it was really special to have you at the Quest 79 event last year as well. So thank you. Thank you. And it's it was so great. I, a number of um, folks uh, from my list joined and, and took on some quests. And it was really inspiring to see that. And I just love the whole thing of getting inspired ourselves so we can inspire others. And, you know, that's that's so important to me in, in this work is having people find the freedom to be what they can be. And you are certainly a master at that. And just recently I'm <laughs> finding out that you were one of the um the coaches for uh from for uh, Zero to Dangerous. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> which is amazing since I had been doing that program. So so um well why don't well first if you want to talk briefly about how did you get here? <laughs> <laughs> that that journey of uh, going from digging from gold in the world to digging for inner gold. You know, the journey of how I get to, got to digging gold in the world is kind of in the in the in the geological sense is kind of interesting because I never planned on being a geologist. I actually started off. Um, I was very fortunate when I was at school. I was I was like pretty good at most things, but nothing ever really jumped out at me. And so I, I kind of went down the medicine route. It was like, well, if you're quite good at Quite a few things especially science and you know go go and do medicine so I actually started off training as a doctor mm. and within about three or four months of starting realized that I didn't like chopping up dead bodies too much and I wasn't really sure I wanted to be a, a GP which a village practitioner which is what I thought being a doctor meant because of my limited life at that point and when you leave the medical school at the university I was at, you walked past the, ge the earth sciences department and I suddenly thought, hmm, that sounds interesting. I like the idea of digging holes in soil more than in people and went in and found out more about it and suddenly found myself switching to become a geologist. And I had no idea that that would lead me. I accidentally then went on to do a PhD, accidentally because I didn't really want to do one of those either. I thought actually I'd rather get a job and earn some money, but I couldn't get a job. But I did then see this PhD advertised that involved climbing in the Andes. And I thought, perfect, well, I don't really want to do a PhD, but if I can get to go climbing in the Andes and, and I can't get a job, that's the next best thing. So <laughs> I ended up doing a PhD in gold geology in the Bolivian Andes. And um, in the process of starting that, just before my first trip to Bolivia, I broke my back and became paralyzed. So I did go back and do that PhD, but the, the, the focus of the research shifted slightly, but it did still involve gold geology in the, in the Andes. So yeah, that's, uh, I, I then worked as a geologist for a while, but it was never quite how I'd imagined. I wanted to be out kind of looking at volcanoes erupt or being a, a, a gold geologist out in the field somewhere. And the reality was that a, a geologist in a wheelchair was probably unlikely to have that career and uh, I was sat behind lots of computer screens, analyzing seismic data and um, kind of petroleum geology, which I wasn't so excited about and didn't feel aligned with at all. Um, and then, yeah, so I ended up shifting and, and retraining completely in 
I guess I just became interested through my own journey and becoming paralyzed and how that triggers us to ask questions about human growth and development. And I think when we experience those difficult things in life, it often is a trigger to start to get interested in that growth process. And it gets called post-traumatic growth, which sounds a bit dramatic, but really, you know, the what 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 the traumas of life enable and how they allow us to have when we have these deep experiences of of perhaps pain or suffering, they can also be a wonderful catalyst into a whole new way of viewing the world. So I got interested in that, retrained and worked for a while in sort of leadership development and then coaching and somewhere along the way I then suddenly got this idea that wouldn't it be cool to try and get go to a Paralympic Games in my own country especially because for the first time hand cycling was going to be in London 2012 and I love to ride my bike my hand bike Mm -hmm. so before I knew it I was off on this track of being a Paralympian and chasing gold medals and yeah in the process I I guess you know, it's. I didn't expect the journey as an athlete to take me on such a deep inner journey as well. But because to take your body to that level of performance and that extreme of suffering, if I'm honest, <laughs> then there's a big internal process that goes with that and a lot of learning that came with it. And that's just been incredible to, to go through that journey and where it's taken me and what it's helped me realize. And the culmination of that in, in the kind of, outward sense and probably in the inward sense as well was in Rio 2016 when I had had a project for four years that I called Project Gold and it was just this well I won a silver medal in London that took me by surprise that was beyond my wildest expectations I was just trying to participate and then it was like okay well actually if I can win a silver medal what do you need to do to get the mind and the body to be even better and it was never about I want to get a gold medal to, I I mean, there's probably some small element that's like ego driven, but in the whole, it felt like it was this intrinsic motivation to discover how do we use our mind to get surprising results? And I never won races. I, I think I once won a race before the race in Rio where not some of the top women weren't even there. That was, that was my, (laughs) my reason for winning it. But it got me super interested in how we can really use our thoughts and our mind and our energies to produce results that are just unexpected. And that was what was so exciting about that process for me. And lots of unexpected twists as, as, as part of that little story, which um, make it, made it even more special to, to manifest that gold medal. <laughs> well, and that's, that's where it's so inspiring in, in terms of because so many of us, hold back from from going for the gold in whatever it is in life with with no real um what you know reality is perception but what we perceive as limitations you know some of us can look at wow there's no excuse for me not going for this and i know that it, you know after the accident it could have been like well that's it. I got screwed by life. And now I'm, uh, you know, I'm confined. And you didn't. It's like, okay, I'm still going to go for this. And then finding these things and like pushing yourself through the, um, the extremes of sports training. You know, it's for me just getting up and doing a workout in the morning. <laughs> and I'm not going for any kind of award. Um, can be challenging. And it's, uh, you know, so it's what is what is that thing? And somehow you tapped into that part of you that knew I'm not going to be stopped by this. I there's far more to me. And I think, uh, you know, how do I get there? Mm-hmm. I mean, I suppose what what very quickly came to me was that recognition, and and we will everyone will get this is that where if I was spending my time when I was first paralyzed thinking about what I couldn't do anymore, I was, and these are all things that I did. I would look at people's legs and feel jealous and envious that they could still move their legs and think, well, if you're not even going to use them and all you're going to do is sit on a sofa and eat pizza, why don't you give me your legs type of thing? I mean, just justifiable (laughs) feelings of jealousy and envy and frustration. And I, I never experienced anger in that sort of sense, but I'm, you know, frustration's a form of that, but, I was thinking about all the things I couldn't do anymore. And I was miserable. I was torturing myself. 
And somewhere along the way, I hadn't read any personal development books. I didn't know about law of attraction or the way we think affects how we feel or any of the stuff that I've now learned. Mm -hmm. I just realized that I felt better if I told myself that I felt better. And I just made, I just put on a brave face. I went out into the world and did things. And I tried to start to focus on what I could do instead of what I couldn't do. I, I literally would open when I open my curtains in the morning. That was my my trigger to train my brain to go. Okay, we're going out into the day. We're we're going to be brave. We're going to try and have a good day today. And I, and when I came home at night, I allowed myself to feel all the feelings. So I used to cry for hours and hours in the evening once my curtains were shut. And but every day I would get up and go again and just tell myself I would focus on what was possible and what I could do. And it was a very you know slightly dramatic lesson in we get what we focus on and you know many people say where your focus goes your energy flows but it's absolutely true and after a while when we put our focus in the right place we do start to see results and it's incremental and whether that was just overcoming the emotions of being paralyzed through to the olympic journey you know, in the beginning, I would go out and train. I'd be absolutely terrible. I'd race. I'd come last. There wasn't even a finish line anymore. And you can go into this really negative narrative of like, why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. I'm never going to make it. And of course, I did do that in my head sometimes. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, well, what, what's going to maybe make you make it? Okay, well, if I do a training session and it's rubbish, it's not going to help me if I just start telling myself how useless I am, how terrible it was, what's the point? how can I change that? So let's come back and say, well done, you went out, you tried, let's see if it's better tomorrow. And just start to like, thank yourself for actually trying and um, just use, shift the narrative. So you're not telling yourself, I'm not an athlete. I go really slowly. You're going, I'm trying to be an athlete. Let's see what happens. And so I, I've never been so, I mean, I don't know if arrogance is the right word, but I've never been so confident to think, I'm going to go to London to the Paralympics. I'm going to win a gold medal. I don't know. Like I just spent my time shifting from any time my mind went into negative or unhelpful stories, narratives, language, self-talk. I would just shift it to the to the most positive thing that felt realistic. So if that was just a pat on the back for even getting out of the door that day or for surviving a rainstorm or just for trying then you know just like an encouraging parent type of approach so I guess that's been my approach with everything <laughs> well I think that's so important for folks to hear one because it would be very easy for many of us to look at you and go wow Karen's accomplished so much with all this challenge she must have this you know unbreakable mindset and never have any doubt and just always knows that she's going to be able to do it it's like Okay, so let's get clear, no. folks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, well, I don't know how it is for everybody else. Maybe maybe there are people like that, but and I, there may be, but you don't have to be that. That no. that that doubt. And the fact that when we have those doubts, it's not proof of that we're right. Oh, well, if I feel like I'm not going to be able to do any good, you know, if I haven't won a race, I'm never going to be able to do that. And because I'm feeling that, I must be right. And you're living proof that no, that's <laughs> we're not stuck by that. That's the, these are the, the the games that our mind plays on us about our but, limitations. Yeah, but what I've got really interested in in more recent years, and this really resonates, I, I think, with what you, with the work that you do and with our common friend Rachel, is um, how. So I've nearly, I've had eight near death experiences. When I say near-death experiences, I mean, I mean, I don't, how do I know how close to death I was? I don't really, but right, right. I was either unconscious or septic. You know, I had sepsis in my system or I'd, I was hit by a car at high speed and was unconscious. So, so kind of situations where I felt like I was a fraction away from maybe not being here. Mm -hmm. And those traumas that we have, and they might just be, they might be emotional traumas as much as um, dramatic physical trauma, like I'm describing here, the impact they can have on us, which subconsciously affects how we feel and how we behave is almost like the more invisible realm of the brain. There's that kind of cognitive, yes, I noticed this thought, so I'll change it to this thought. But then there's the more subtle stuff that goes on as well, the layers which are 
not so easy to find and analyze and that's uh, where I guess where my journey prior to Rio but certainly certainly in the last five or six years has really taken me into more of that I've uh, had quite a lot of problem health problems in the last number of years and you can start to re you know, I've realized that they can track to certain events or emotions that I've perhaps not processed or that I've suppressed through a process because I was so busy focused on trying to get to the Olympics. It's sometimes you just crack on and get on and don't make space for processing things. So yeah, that's another realm I think, which can affect how we feel as well, rather than it just being, we can just quickly change our thought like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just a matter of piling on accomplishments. So you just forget about all that trauma the <laughs> if mm -hmm. I just succeed enough, then I don't have to worry about that. So it's moving forward while also processing, okay, what else might hold me back and what other doubts might there be? And just knowing, yeah. trying to have that knowledge of um, that gold is in there. <laughs> if I, if I just keep striving and I, and I keep moving forward and, and having that awareness and going, okay, this is what my mind is telling me based on all kinds of programming, based on all kinds of experiences, this is what I'm telling myself, but that's just a thought and mm -hmm. I can change that. Yeah. And I think it's really easy for us to focus on our, either our accomplishments or our failures and the string of those things that happen in the external world, which is very easy to start to identify with and let define us, but actually, you know, what's going on on that inner journey and how can we how can we unravel that is the really you know like people I, I sometimes get labeled as or i label myself as an adventurer or an explorer but for me the internal side of that is just as important more important more profound and more interesting sometimes than the external because you can have a wonderful adventure just sat on your sofa discovering all kinds of things that you <laughs> never discovered before yeah well that's like the the internal adventure as well yeah. And there are peaks and valleys and, and dangerous cliffs <laughs> and, uh, and gold mines to, you know, gold fields to, to mine. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so then you came up with this idea of quest 79. <laughs> so that, you know, I didn't really come up with, well, I suppose I must've come up with some idea around <laughs> it, but it, again, it was sort of very, you know, it just arrived. So the team, the cycling team had been joking with me all summer prior to the Rio Paralympics about the number 79. So I had developed an addiction to chai latte from a well-known cafe chain. And I was going into the same cafe every day when I was training and asking for it extra hot. And the barista said to me, ask at 79 degrees, that's the hottest the machine makes it. So you can imagine as soon as your teammates hear you asking for something at a specific temperature, it's like, well, what kind of a diva are you? So it became this joke. And for about three months, every time I saw anyone on the team, they're like, hey, hey, Karen, how are you doing? You look hot. You must be at least 79 degrees, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it was just, and then I, I won the gold medal and watched a video of the first hundred medals in a hundred seconds for Britain. So it was like one image of an athlete every second with their medal and mine happened to be the 100th medal sorry the 79th medal for britain and so it was a picture of me with this giant number 79 on me and i'm like that's weird and suddenly 79 just started cropping up everywhere from um i was been i'd been dreaming of some islands in scotland that i wanted to visit from directly from rio as a recovery place and there was a newspaper article that a friend sent me to say there was a, a ferry run aground there and 79 passengers were stranded. Suddenly, I, I'd totally forgotten that 79, even though I'd been a gold geologist, is the atomic number of gold. And everywhere I looked, I just kept seeing 79. And I know that once we're switched on to something, we see it more, but it did seem a little too strange. Yeah that I was seeing this number everywhere. And that got me interested in numerology and then I ended up having readings done about this and discovering it all. But in the process, the number seven, and tr the number seven triggered for me because I was a climber. A lot of climbers go and climb the highest mountain on every continent, each of the seven summits. Mm. And I've always had this kind of interest in hand cycling and traveling with my handbike. 
So I just got this idea, hey, I like the idea of riding on seven continents. And why don't we make it seven continents, nine rides? This was just, this was actually the winter after Rio when I was sat around feeling a bit miserable and thinking about things or just that kind of period just immediately after Rio. And so I decided that that was the first ride. Rio had been the first ride. It was like the golden, I called it the golden way. Mm -hmm. And then I just planned a route on each of the other continents that were all related to water, which um, I believe will be the gold of the future. <laughs> so the, the rides have all been following coastlines and rivers on different continents. And um I didn't really have a plan. I didn't have any great budget. I don't have a team. I think people think I've got some kind of mastermind team and a, and a big like camper van. I don't know what people think. I really don't. But literally, it's me, my laptop, my sofa, my handbike. Oh, right. How's that going to happen then? And people, I just would mention it to people. And suddenly a friend would say, hey, I'll, I'd like to come on that ride. Or I haven't ridden a bike since I was five years old, but I'll come and do that one. So each of the journeys has been with people who've maybe never done anything like that before. They maybe haven't ridden a bike since they were tiny, if ever. They've never camped. Um, they've all been just very simple, just no vehicles, just traveling independently. My, usually I try to have friends that are strong enough to offer to tow my wheelchair on a trailer behind their bike. But there have been rides where I've towed my wheelchair behind my own bike with a bag in it. And that's had to be flatter routes but essentially yeah these rides have happened and one continent remains and it's proving to be the most well it is probably the most special golden continent on our planet and that's antarctica and it's uh, wow. a real privilege to i think for anyone to go to antarctica it's we have to take it as an incredible privilege and uh, we're still fundraising for that but we've raised over half of the money now and in theory, are leaving. Well, I'm not going to say in theory. We are leaving on the 18th of December um, to go to the South Pole, and it will be called the Pole of Possibility. To wow. ideally, just yeah, just spread that message as far as far and wide as we can. That when we, you know, when we can, we can all do incredible things if we allow ourselves to think that way and lead ourselves that way amazing things are possible. Yeah, I, most if not all of us are barely scratching the surface of what's possible. And good news, we don't all have to have a, a terrible accident in order to motivate us. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, well, also, easy for Karen, you know, she had to overcome some things. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think we, we, the thing is that we're all overcoming something in some way, like the stuff I've had to overcome is really obvious because I'm sat in a wheelchair and it affronts people and they see me and they wonder what happened and they ask you questions and they tell you how inspiring you are. But, you know, basically we're, we're all inspiring each other and right. we're, we're all, we all have our different struggles to overcome. And ironically, if we don't have a struggle, the struggle becomes that we haven't got a struggle because it's almost like if things are too calm and comfortable, then that's not really okay either because then we're not growing. So I think the important thing is that we're learning and growing and that doesn't need to mean having catastrophic events. They probably help accelerate that process, but let's not invite them. Like we could actually, I suppose what some of Quest 79 has been about and the Paralympic journey, that's things I've chosen to do, which have accelerated growth and we can all do that i think we just the, the key is i think just not enabling ourselves to get stuck in a rut in a comfort zone for too long because then we can become a bit lazy a bit bored a bit frustrated even if we don't realize it and that's when we maybe overeat or over drink or things just don't feel quite as lively as we'd like them to and yeah <laughs> yeah and i I always have this thing of, I don't believe in the word lazy because to me, it's always fear. It's always a matter of, or, or resistance. There's a, there's a part of us that it's like, we stop ourselves from taking action because the, oh, it's, it's always a matter of the balance between motivation and resistance and mm -hmm. the way, weighing the pros and cons. And so if we're, when we're being lazy, it's because the pros haven't outweighed the cons yet. Yeah. And a lot of those cons maybe the other con it's a, it's a total con it's a con game that we're playing on ourselves and as you said yeah we all have those 
challenges to overcome. And many of them are just in our mind and our, in our programming. And I, I believe that everyone's doing the best they can in a given moment, given their programming. And we have no idea what kind of programming is going on for someone. Yeah. Um, I've used the analogy of two people running down a track and they both are, um, have a rope pulling a trunk and one person runs really fast. The other person's running really slow and they, and the fast one goes, Oh, you're just lazy. You're just not trying hard enough. It's like, let's open those trunks. <laughs> and one of them is, has a couple of pebbles and the other one has is completely full of bricks. And so we never really know what, uh, what's going on. And so it's just a matter of finding out, okay, how do I, I deserve to overcome this. I deserve better. And what's it going to take and how do I, uh, how do I get over this and, and, and find that inner gold? And those are exactly the questions that you asked there. The, they're the curiosity questions, the opening up questions. And I think certainly in the past or in uh, at various points, I think we all find ourselves not thinking like that. We're, we're, we're looking at the limitation and we're focusing on that and we're closing things down. Yeah. And an easy way to just offload some of that luggage in the, in the trailer is to start asking questions like, yeah. What will it take? How might this be possible? And that is an incredibly opening, lightning place to come from, I think. Yeah. And we, we slip into those comfort zones and we, we, we get into groups of people with loaded trunks. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's just how it is. Yeah. Well, are you going to try hard? No, no, I don't want, you know, and then, and I meet a lot of people. It's like, if I, if I allow myself to excel, it'll make the people in my family or my friends uncomfortable. Yeah. And I can't do that. And I've, I'll confront people in workshops. I go, please, please do that. Don't make it easier for them to settle for less than what they're capable of. Yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. settle for what you don't settle for less than what you're capable of. And please don't, you know, tell someone else, all right, I'll, I'll settle for less. And, and you settle for less and we can all, because that's the world doesn't move forward if everyone's settling for less. <laughs> No, absolutely. And it's, it is an interesting one because, because ultimately we, part of being human means that we want to love and be loved and to fit in and be part of a tribe. But actually in order to keep moving forward, that often requires one of the bravest things, which is to be alone or step out of a tribe to find a new tribe or right. to, 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 to go through that journey, which can be really scary, which means letting go of a place or a person or a scenario or a, yeah, a lifestyle, which. And then it's inviting us anymore. Yeah. It's going to get into that place and then inviting people to come with you. So, so I'll talk about, um, you know, it's like, we're all of, all of my friends were all stuck in the mud and we've got jackets. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, I'm going to step up on the dry ground and meet the people up there. And we've got better jackets up there. And then I can invite my friends up. You know, and that's, oh. and that's what I love about what you're, you're in the, the whole quest number nine. It's not, Hey, I've won this gold in Rio and I've done this fantastic thing. It's like, no, I've overcome these things. Come with me. <laughs> You've got, you, you can do this. And Well, you know what? There's some stories in there that have, well, all the stories inspire me. There's been some incredible ones. So there's, there's a friend, I say this one, cause I'm looking out of my window into the darkness um, here on the Island of Mallorca in Spain. And there's a big fountain there. And my friend, hikes up it quite often and we got chatting about quest 79 and she's like hmm I want to do a quest so she comes along one day and she says I think I'm going to climb the mountain 79 times I said what in 79 days and she went no I can't I can't do that that's too much like maybe I do 79 times but I don't know how long it'll take me she climbed the mountain 79 times in six weeks wow. which is a lot quicker than 79 days so yes. they did it three times incredible and each time she went a different maybe sometimes she went on her own but quite often different people would start coming with her because people saw her doing this quest and they're like I want to come with you I've never been up that mountain and by the by the time she did it for the 79th time I think all the Spanish COVID rules were potentially broken. I think there were a very large gang of uh, people on top of this mountain for the 79th time with a, a drone footage of them all waving up there and having the time of their life. And I just thought, this is what it's all about. Yeah. And a Reaching lot of those- Reaching the top uh, and bringing people with you. <laughs> it, yeah. It was a perfect analogy for it and uh, super good. <laughs> awesome.
Awesome. Well, thank you for all of your efforts to overcome things and be such an inspiring, uh, you know, an inspiring champion and, and putting out that challenge for others to, uh, to find out what their inner gold is. Um, I, I greatly appreciate you and what you're up to. And thank you so much for spending time with my audience. No, thank you. And uh, I, maybe, I, maybe I could just wrap up with a reflection because I've been so inspired by a lot of the Quest 79s that have happened that I decided I was feeling really flat in April and I felt like I'd got in a bit of a rut for some reason. So I decided to kick my own butt for May. And I thought <laughs> my initial idea was not what has happened, that what's happened is a bit too full on almost. But I thought every day of May, I'm going to do something different that I wouldn't normally do. And then suddenly I realized that I was starting to do a new Quest 79 every day of May. So then that became the thing. It's like, actually, can I do 31 Quest 79s and then have them all running for 79 days? So I'm like at the absolute pinnacle of it right now. This next month is going to be all 79 things running, but they're tiny things, but beautiful things. So one of the ladies did was well, she was collecting litter every day. So I just pick up a piece of litter when I'm out every day at the moment. Um, one is take a picture of a flower every day. One is um, just give thanks to my body every day for what it does to for me. One is um, just to do something kind for someone every day. And so collectively, it act, they're all tiny things, but it's really shifted my life a lot since the 30, 20, how many days are in April? Since the end of April. I feel like I'm really flying high at the moment and really yeah. enjoying that process. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that. It was a kind of an that's, interesting month. That's awesome. That's awesome. And it's great for everyone to hear because it, it, it can be tiny things. We sit there and go, oh, well, unless it's going to be winning the gold at Rio or climbing this mountain or, or this. And it's tiny things. Yeah. It's all and, the tiny things. Absolutely. And winning a gold medal is the tiny things. It's, it's you know, it, it only happens because you get up every day and you do the tiny thing, but you do it every day. It's the culmination of a lot of tiny things. Yeah. yeah. So please, everyone, go out and do some tiny things. <laughs> and they will lead yeah. to big things. And mm -hmm. uh, the world will be better for it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Karen. Thank you. <laughs>